What is money? For most people, money is what you earn. It's a reward. And the beginning of uh, new economics of money, if there is some such a thing, is to the study of monetary rewards in the brain. But I don't think it defines clearly the field, or fully the field. Okay, money is a reward. We know that. And we know that money, as a reward, activates some areas in the brain, like sex or drugs, or any kind of reward, or primary reward. So the problem is whether money is only a primary reward. I don't think so. Money is a primary reward, but it's also what we call a secondary reward. It's a primary reinforcer. We enjoy having money a lot. It even affects our bodily uh, states, our behavior. When we have money, uh, a lot of uh, money, I don't have money on me, but when we have money like that, you see, a lot of money like that, I feel, I feel great. Really, this has been shown by people like Cathy Voss, for instance, the impact of money on bodily states. But it's not enough. Money is not only like that. If I take, oh, it's a small bill, but you see there are some figures, there are some symbols on it. So I know that I can use this only in Russia. If I go back to Paris, nobody will want that. I say, oh, it's interesting. It's a picture? No. So money is also a very abstract thing. And I think the new economics of money should not be interested only in the reward aspect, but also in the abstract, symbolic, cultural aspect. And this is what I am interested in. So how we go from a primary reward to a secondary reward? This is the first neuroscientific question we can ask about money. Second question is how we deal with the abstract features of money. How do we recognize that this is good for Russia, but this is, this is not good for France or the United States? This is not good, no use. Can the brain know that? So a few years ago with a colleague of mine in Paris, Catherine Talon-Baudry, and students of, of ours at that time, Florent Meniel, we ran a very, very basic experiment. We use coins. Coins, euro coins, one euro, one franc, no more franc at that time in France, one Australian dollar, one Finnish mark. So our subjects, they knew the franc and the euro coins, but they had never met with the Australian dollar coin or the Finnish mark coin. They didn't know that, they haven't seen that, we checked for that. And we put them in a brain imaging setting, in EMEG, and we were observing the reactions of the brain when they saw those coins. We asked them not to say what coin it is, but just to click when they saw twice in a row the same coin. And we analyzed the data, the brain activity, when they viewed those coins. And what we observed was very strange, in fact. We observed that the familiarity with the coin, the fact that they haven't seen the Australian mark, or the fact that they had seen the franc, made no difference in the brain. The familiarity had no impact on the recognition of the brain, the visual recognition of the coin, sorry. This is one result. The second result is that the brain processed those visual stimuli and make the difference between valid coin and non-valid coin very quickly. Valid coin in the sense that you can use the, the euro today, you can use the Australian dollar, but you cannot use anymore the franc or the Finnish mark. So this is a very abstract notion, the fact that you can use those coins or not in some context. This is very abstract. And the brain could decode this in 150 milliseconds, which is very, very fast. So no impact of familiarity and automaticity or fastness of the processing of the validity aspect, namely the abstract aspect of the currency. This is very strange because if you consider recognizing a word belonging to a natural language, if I say, are you Georgia, pretending to speak Russian, but it's obviously not Russian. Even if you're a Russian speaker, it will take 450 seconds, 50 milliseconds or something like that to recognize that this is not a word of your natural language. This is an abstract thing, recognizing whether a word belongs to a natural language or not. But recognizing whether a coin belongs to this nation, or at least it has some purchasing power now, in our experiment, takes only 150 milliseconds. 
For a cultural thing, for a conventional thing, this is remarkably fast. So this is something that, for me, is at the core of what we can call the new economics of money. How the brain developed an ability to process such an abstract feature as monetary validity by seeing some coins, some visual stimuli. How is it possible? I mean, it doesn't, for words, it takes more time. Language is a natural ability, but for words, it takes more time. For coins, which is very cultural, very abstract, very conventional, which is an economic artifact, which is very recent from an histori historical or evolutionary perspective. It's only 7,000 years ago that we, ha we can see the first coins in Lydia. So how did the brain do that? We have an hypothesis uh, that we share with some neuroscientists, or at least new some neuroscientists like Stanislas Dehn in Paris, for instance, as this view that the brain has recycled some old evolutionary neural pathways in order to process with novelties, with cultural novelties. But he speaks about uh, reading or numbers, not about coins. So to carry over this hypothesis of a cultural recycling uh, of cortical networks in order to process cultural novelty to the economic realm is a step that is a little bit daring. I try to make this step in fact, to see whether, in fact, uh, we develop some special abilities uh, in the past thousand years in order to deal with the economic artifacts that we created in our recent history, human history. That could be the case for coins. In our experiment, we noticed that the main validity effect, the fact that uh, people could recognize the validity or the invalidity of the coin, the main validity effect took place in the fusiform gyrus, which is a little part of the visual brain, uh, which is dedicated uh, to the recognition of faces, of human faces. So in this area of the brain, I can process faces, something which is a face or not a face. I can categorize faces. I can also maybe categorize in the, in the fusiform gyrus uh, whether some food is energetic or not. So broadly, I could say that in this area of the brain, I can maybe recognize what is good and what is not good, what is a face, what is not a face. There is a categorization taking place here, maybe in terms of validity. So maybe what we discovered is not specific to coins, but specific to the classification of something valid and something invalid, something good or something not good. Good for us, not good for us. Good for our survival, not good for our survival. It's important to recognize whether this is a human face or something else. It is important to recognize whether this is poison or whether this is a good food for me, uh, in evolutionary terms. So maybe we, we recycle some kind of activity like that in order to recognize, oh, this coin is good, this coin is not good for what I need to do today. Okay, so this is an idea of cultural recycling that I borrowed to some other people in some other fields. This is a very speculative idea, and this could be the beginning of a new economics of money. It's not the only thing that we can say about money in the brain. Money is the brain. Money is very composite. It's a very hybrid item in the world. It's, as I said, a material object and a very symbolic object. It's very dual is the interface of something very biological and something very cultural. A primary reinforcer like sex, sex and drug or food, and a very cultural item uh, relying on a convention, relying on boundaries, on countries, stuff like that. So it's something very complicated. Where to locate money in the spectrum of a human production or biological production? So new economics of, of money can be interested, I said, for the moment, in two things. Uh, the transition from primary reward to secondary reward that was the first thing. Second thing is how we deal with this very cultural item in a very automatic way, in a very fast way. How the brain can do that and how maybe it recycled some basic uh, evolutionary abilities, or biological abilities, in order to process with those cultural items. That was the two first ideas. Now, if we want to uh, pursue a research program, as I do, that would be called the new economics of money, we have to connect economic theory and biology or neuroscience, as usual. We have to connect those two things. 
So what part of, which part of economic theory can we use uh, that could fit with a biological research program? This is not obvious. So the idea here is the following. In the recent years, some views on money are what we can call micro-foundational. They are interested in individual behavior, in the emergence of money at a very individual microeconomic level. Not money simply as a macroeconomic phenomenon, as something that the central bank controls in terms of input or output of money, for instance, in a country, but something at the very individual level. This is the Menger's hypothesis in economic. Menger was an Austrian economist who thought about the emergence of money at a very individual level. And this is where the new economics of money can take some inspiration. So now if you think that uh, you have something, I have something, but it's, we don't want to exchange those things. Okay, no barter. And there is some, somebody else somewhere or well, something else that maybe interests us. Okay, but it's, not, it's out of reach for the moment. So maybe we need some money in order to organize this exchange. So at a very basic level, we need to understand that you have something, that I have something, but maybe our wants don't coincide. But if we add something in the middle, a medium for exchange, that will go. So we need some strategic ability. We need some beliefs about uh, your needs, my needs, the needs of other people. So we need some beliefs, in fact. So at a very basic level, we need an economic structure. We need to understand this economic structure, trade, how it functions. And we need to understand the beliefs of other, some strategizing or theory of mind abilities. In fact, this is called like this. So maybe money depends on those uh, beliefs that we have. And those beliefs, they have a biological realization. And the meeting of beliefs in the world also some people say today, have some biological markers. So maybe the study of money is, to, is connected to the study of the theory of mind in neuroscience. This is one thing. We have to understand the way we coordinate, the way we cooperate. And this is a very big program in neuroeconomics today, a program that doesn't touch to money so far, but that could, in fact. So the study of money is, in fact, a connection this is the third aspect of a research program on the neuroeconomics of money, could, could touch upon uh, the way our belief structures are implemented and the way the economic structure functions. It is the meeting between a cognitive system with some basic learning abilities, belief abilities, and an economic fundamental structure. This is where we can develop, I think, a research program in this field of money.